Um, so the first speaker that we'll hear from is David Metz. Um, so Professor David Metz is Honorary Professor at UCL's Centre for Transport Studies. And before that, he was Chief Scientist at the Department for Transport. His talk today is, what's the use of cycling? Thank you, David. Thanks. So could I have the first slide? Um, okay, so it, it might seem a rather odd title for a talk. Um, surely, however you look at it, cycling has got to be a good thing when it comes to decarbonizing the transport system. But there's more to it than that. Could I have the next slide? Um, a few years ago, I paid a, a visit to Copenhagen, a study visit with a group of urbanists, and we were Looking at cycling, we were cycling around the city over a weekend and uh, we were being told about their achievements and viewing their infrastructure and their so strong cycling culture, of which they're very proud and indeed they publish at intervals an account of this, this uh, called the, the bicycle account. Um, and that enables us to compare uh, what is happening in Copenhagen with what's happening in uh, our own capital city, London, where Transport for London um, publish excellent statistics. So if we could have the next slide. This shows the trip mode share comparing Copenhagen and London. Um, and the cycling um, is indicated by the grey segment. So in Copenhagen, you see a large slice for cycling, uh, about 29% averaged over uh, the week, and that compares with that very slim segment in London, about two and a half percent. So when at the beginning of the pandemic, the mayor of London said he wanted to increase cycling in London by tenfold, you could see in principle that could be possible with enough investment. Um, but when you're in Copenhagen, you realize there's quite a lot of general traffic, car traffic. And that's shown in the blue segments. And in fact, Copenhagen uh, has only slightly less car traffic than London as a proportion of trip share, 34% um, versus 36%. The other big difference between Copenhagen and London is public transport, where Copenhagen has about half the use of public transport in London. That's the, the yellow. Um, share which is here compared with there. So that uh, indicates that you can get people off the buses onto bikes because as we know bikes are cheaper, healthier, environmentally better and no slower than buses on congested roads. But we don't really want to get people off buses because the bus is an efficient way of moving people around and although at the moment they're mostly diesel powered they will uh, become electric or hydrogen fuel cell. Um, and moreover, if we get people off the buses, we reduce the fare income to the operators and that risks a worsening of service or the need for greater subsidy. So we really want to get people out of their cars onto bikes, but even in Copenhagen, that seems difficult. And Copenhagen is a small flat city, unlike London, which is large and in parts quite hilly. Copenhagen has excellent cycling infrastructure segregated from main traffic. Um, and it has a very strong cycling culture. I mean, all those motorists in Copenhagen either have bikes at home and use them for other trips or have had bikes and have used them. So the challenge is how do you get people um, out of their cars onto bikes? Let's look at some other cities. Next slide, please. So this is a compilation made by the, the Wuppertal Institute, who've um, surveyed a number of European cities. Um, I mean, the, the pattern varies enormously, and it's a function of history and geography, particularly population density, and um, where the boundaries are drawn. But if we focus on the red segments, which are cycling, and to the right of those, the pale grey segments, which are public transport. 
you will see the data for London and Copenhagen as, as we've seen. You'll see lower down, Amsterdam is quite like Copenhagen with high levels of cycling and modest levels of public transport. In contrast, we've got cities like Vienna and Zurich with very good tram systems. So high levels of public transport use and quite modest levels of cycling use. So quite a varied pattern, but what we don't find are cities with high levels of both public transport and cycling, which is consistent with the proposition that if we aim to attract people, more people to cycling, we're likely to take them from public transport. So could I have the next slide? Now, it'd be nice to know why those motorists in Copenhagen are using their cars when they've got the capability and experience and infrastructure which would allow them to cycle. We don't have survey data on that to my knowledge, but, you know, from our general experience, we, you know, do, can recognise that a car can be more attractive than active travel or public transport. For example, where you're carrying people or, and, and goods, um, where you're making longer trips, or, or you, you know, want to involve less sweat, depending where you're going to end up in your trip. And more generally, the, you know, the car, um, where there's room to use it, that's to say where there's not too much road congestion and where you can park at both ends of the journey, the car is an e effective way of uh, getting to, uh, from door to door travel uh, over moderate distances, which is why it's so popular, responsible, as we know in Britain for 61% you know, of all trips and 77% of distance travel. But the, the attractions of the car are not just about um, the practicalities of travel, there are feel good factors. You know, why are people buying all these large SUVs? Um, I guess because they feel you know, good about owning them. And then there's the well known fact that cars are parked 95% of the time. And that's a good economic argument for car sharing, for sharing, spreading the capital costs over more trips. But conversely, the fact that people are willing to invest in something that's not used for 95% of the time indicates the value they place on, on having the car available. And that's not unique. I mean, my washing machine sits around for 95% of the time not used. Uh, I could share with others a laundrette, but actually it's more convenient to have my own. So next slide, please. Thinking about attitudes to the car, on the one hand, there are what we call car dependence, which I think we, you know, is well known to us. Um, and this, I think, covers two situations. One is locations inaccessible by a car. For example, uh, new housing estates on greenfield sites with poor, if any, provision for public transport and cycling. Um, and more generally, there's a, a situation, I think, where people use the car when they might use walking or cycling for short trips. And we kind of rather condemn that. And, Car dependence and is a bit like you know alcohol dependence or drug dependence, something that's really undesirable. But on the other hand, there are a variety of um, uh, kinds of evidence about more positive attitudes to the car. And one I've noticed recently is the concept of car pride, which has been developed by researchers at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And they're picking up from the social science literature to do with pride generally, where it can boost the personal image or reflection of personal image, but also of social superiority. So these researchers gen generated questionnaires to investigate car pride in American cities and then applied this to television inter interviews internationally. And the next slide shows their findings. Um, so on the vertical axis, we're, we have their measure of car pride and they've plotted out the data in rank order for a number of, quite a number of countries, both developed and developing. So on the left-hand side, we have the lowest levels of pride expressed in Japan, in Ukraine, in France. The UK is um, round about the middle here, relatively high by European standards. The USA is the highest of uh, the developed economies. And then beyond that, you've got developing economies where I guess Car ownership reflects, uh, you know, social status that you've, you've made it in some way. 
So if we're interested in reducing car use and reducing car ownership, we have to realize that there are um, factors which are in some sense measurable as shown here, uh, which aren't to do with alternative modes of travel. Um, and the question is, you know, wh why is there so much more uh, car pride in Britain than in, in France? And I don't think we have much idea of that. Um, this is a snapshot at one point in time, and a new factor here is the introduction of electric vehicles, because you can imagine that people who acquire electric vehicles would have a greater sense of pride in car ownership than they had before. Um, so next slide, please. Now I mentioned uh, the economic case for car sharing and sharing in, in all forms has been uh, facilitated enormously by what are called digital platforms, uh, revolutionized retail, growth of Amazon and so forth. And in the travel sector, we see this uh, in the form of ride hailing taxis, which exemplified by Uber, but many other brands in other countries and online reservations for rail and travel, with the train line, a very successful business for booking rail tickets. And then we had a great surge of investment in dockless bicycles a few years ago, though these have seemed to have faded from the scene and I think investors lost money because you know, the returns weren't sufficient. We still have e-bikes around and we're trialing e-scooters and then there are various forms of uh, shared car ownership and also uh, modes of car shared use, use typically booking via an app, uh, demand for lots of travel, using booking minibuses, using a smartphone app and mobility as a service. Now, a characteristic of digital platforms is if they look promising, they attract uh, entrepreneurs and major investment. And that's what we've seen with the two or three top items on the list. But we haven't seen that with the others, and I don't think we're going to because I don't think the benefits are going to be big enough to attract major investment. That's not to say some of these others won't grow, but I think they'll grow in niche markets, not main markets. And that means uh, what we can expect in terms of decarbonisation uh, from vehicle sharing uh, or last mile uh, mobility. Uh, is going to be relatively modest. So if you've been rather optimistic about car sharing um, and these other innovations um, in terms of transport decarbonisation, I think you're, you're being quite optimistic, which brings me on to the next slide, which is the topic of optimism bias. Now, the transport models we use to project the consequences of interventions to reduce carbon emissions, these models are quite complex, they're opaque, they're hard to you know, see into. There are many parameters requiring judgment of the modeler. Um, and the models can't be, be validated by comparison of uh, forecasts without term uh, because the time scales are too long. So these models are prone to bias, um, where, for example, modelers may unconsciously select the parameters to generate outcomes that they think will um, be what the, those who commission the modeling want to see. And in some cases, um, there may be uh, an intentional bias to uh, make a, for example, a, a PET scheme more uh, economically attractive for inclusion in an investi uh, investment program. Now, this particular aspect has been well recognized um, and is uh, included uh, in the Treasury Green Book for Investment Appraisal and the Department of Transport's Transport Analysis Guidance. And they allow for this by requiring uplift factors for initial capital costs of new schemes as much as 44%, a figure which declines over time as uh, the capital costs become better defined. Now we also um, encounter optimism bias on the travel demand side in competitive bidding situations, uh, where there's an incentive for the bidder to bid high to take an optimistic view of demand in order to win uh, a, a franchise. For example, the rail franchises in the UK awarded by competitive bidding. Uh, some of the winners uh, bid too much because they were too optimistic about demand. 
and uh, their franchises failed, they became unviable and the state had to take over. And in a similar way, in Australia, uh, they had a number of um, competitive bidding situations for new toll roads, where the winning bid, um, which was making a payment to the state, uh, were too optimistic about um, uh, the prospective revenue. And uh, the investors who thought they were putting money into safe infrastructure were very disappointed and went to court and sued. And, most cases were settled out of court, but in one case, a leading transport consultant had to pay $200 million compensation to investors for an over-optimistic forecast of demand. Now, an example on the cycling side um, is the propensity to cycle tool, which has been developed by a number of uh, academic researchers with support from the Department of Transport. The tool allows local authorities to assess how much uh, demand there might be for cycling, taking account of local uh, geography uh, and policy aspiration. Um, the tool advises on um, uh, what carbon emissions might be achieved, on the assumption that commuters are equally likely to switch to cycling from any prior mode. So if the main uh, prior mode was car use, the tool would assume most of the switch was from car use. But there's no evidence in support of that offered. And indeed the argument I've been making about the likelihood of attracting people from public transport would mean that if you assume substantial switching from car use, you would be overestimating um, the carbon reduction. The problem with optimism bias is that you may not get the outcome you seek, which would lead to disappointment in terms of carbon reduction. And there may also be unintended consequences, for example, like a, you know, a da damage to, the, to bus services. So um, can I have the next slide? Now, one um, modeling exercise we're particularly interested in is the Department of Transport's modeling that underpins their decarbonization plan, where they presented their findings in terms of rather well, fuzzy diagrams, a sort of a, a green line showing um, the declining carbon emissions as a result of the policy and a, a blue line showing uh, no reduction if no action was taken. And they've also provided some headline figures for the total carbon reductions, million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent over the 30 year period 2020 to 2050. And for cycling and walking, the figure is one to six uh, million tons which is a very wide range, indicating considerable uncertainty uh, in their minds about the impact of active travel on decarbonisation. In contrast for cars, the figures are 620 to 850. Um, a narrower range indicating, I suppose, greater confidence about the, the policy impact of the measures to phase out the internal combustion engine. But what I find very surprising is the disparity between these numbers. I mean, if cycling and walking were at the highest end of the range and cars at the lowest, active travel would contribute only 1% of the combined total. And if it were cycling and walking at the lower end and cars at the higher end, it would be near a 0.1%. This is really surprising given the prominence uh, of cycling and walking in the narrative of the transport decarbonisation plan and the, um, uh, I think it's two billion pounds expenditure planned to boost active travel. Now, it would be interesting to see um, the details of the department's modeling to see whether, for example, there's optimism bias in favor of technological innovation and perhaps pessimism bias about behavioral change. However, the department's modeling is based on the national transport model, which has never been open and public in part because the department says it's based on uh, proprietary software by consultants. And in fact, this is a general situation in transport modeling, as far as I can see, nearly all the modeling is carried out by consultants with proprietary software. And so this isn't really open to external scrutiny. Um, this contrasts with the modeling uh, of climate change itself which is an international collaborative 
transparent exercise which feeds in to the findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And nearer to home, we have the example of the epidemiological modeling of the coronavirus pandemic, which has been uh, important in informing government policy on uh, lockdowns and vaccinations and so forth. This has been carried out not within government, but by three university groups uh, in an open and collaborative fashion feeding their findings into the, um, the, the emergency group on, uh, or the scientific advisory group on emergencies. So that open and com uh, collaborative uh, modeling is what we need to inform public policy in the area of decarbonization. So if I can have the next slide, which is the last slide, Conclusions. When we're thinking about changing travel behaviour, which is what we are keen to do, we need to consider the mode from which mode switching occurs, or we hope it to occur. So it's not enough to say, you know, more cycling is a good thing. You have to say, from where um, will those cyclists come? And I think the challenge is to get people out of cars, and I think that is uh, not easy because we tend to underestimate. The attractions of individual car ownership. I mean, there are what, 32, 33 million cars on the roads of Britain, which cost people quite a lot of money to buy and operate. And you have to suppose it's really quite a lot of benefits uh, to offset the cost, benefits both in terms of travel, um, but also the wider factors that I've discussed, which we, you know, I think rather, we barely understand. We need to be aware of optimism bias. We, I mean, we should be optimistic, but if we're over optimistic, and the assumptions we make, we will be disappointed in outcomes. And as I've argued, we need a much more transparent, collaborative approach to modeling to understand um, where we might get to with the whole range of policies, including the promotion of cycling. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, David for that very interesting talk. Um, there's quite a lot going on. Hello, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about community bicycle workshops or bicycle kitchens as contributors to low carbon sustainable uh, transport. And the key point is at the end of this slide, it's about increasing cycling demand. Uh, so my name's Simon Batterbury. I've been working on this stuff for a few years. I'm based at uh, Melbourne and formerly at Lancaster, where I'm still a visiting prof. And you can see an example of a, the thing I'm going to talk about here, a bicycle community workshop. And the talk uh, comprises activities conducted with uh, quite a few other people. And some of them are here. We have a website and uh, we're doing a communal book about bicycle workshops worldwide. So I'm going to talk about uh, four major things and the major point is to look at typologies and the major issues affecting bicycle workshops but I will first introduce them. So first off urban cycling active travel and justice. Active urban cycling is a low hanging fruit to reduce CO2 clearly because um, it has extremely low but not zero uh, carbon emissions uh, it keeps you fit and healthy, and it's a response to mo mobility crises like urban congestion, breakdowns of public transport, and even the growing COVID crisis, um, because it's generally thought that you have less chance of um, catching COVID on a bicycle than you do on public transport, for instance. Uh, this type of active travel is slowed by air pollutants, various dangers, social stigma, and harassment and sometimes poor infrastructure, in fact quite often, but really we see a patchy renaissance of urban cycling right now as the climate emergency deepens and as we have the sort of virusine inputs of uh, COVID and everything else. Um, the job of the state in all of this has generally been to improve the supply of cycling infrastructure, to make it less dangerous, to make it more convenient. Bicycle, bicycle, bike parking, free tool stands, things like that. This needs money, technical expertise, 
from civil engineers, from urban planners, and a control of road space and public land. And that's really what sustainable transport organizations and policymakers know best, how to provide um, the carrots for cyclists or the supply side to increase people's propensity to cycle. Problems with that are tokenistic responses li linked to budget restrictions, election cycles. Uh, the car lobby can often destroy um, uh, various forms of pro-cycling infrastructure. There's an example in Montpellier of 2019, a city that is not particularly keen on increasing cycle infrastructure, and that, that was the size of the protest that they got about their failure to include enough cycling in the urban budget. So this immediately raises the point that cycling is quite political. I'm interested in the demand side of cycling, where urban cycling is enlisted by developers, style influencers, as a kind of a hip gentrifying activity, but also the gritty and rather anarchic side of cycling, like community workshops where we fix and learn to fix our bicycles, cycling for necessity amongst particular user groups in the city, or cycling for the environment where people freely choose to cycle because it's active travel and it's not polluting. So hopeful urban mobilities following Henri Lefebvre include things like circuits of resistance, building autonomy and collective actions, asserting your right to mobility, the right to pollution-free urban living and movement, reclaiming road space and rights to our reclamation of public space for active travel, and creating uh, a group of what we call autonomous cyclists, encompassed by the French term vélonomie, people who can fix their own bikes. As part of bicycle justice, um, and looking beyond transport issues to the place that bicycle organizations have in a community and economy. Demand side support to cycling is heavily political as well as environmental with economic and social aspects. Here is an example of a community bike workshop. It's situated about a kilometer from where I am in full lockdown in Melbourne, Australia. Sorry, I don't have a Lancaster picture for you, but I could have done. Um, and in this uh, workshop, which has been built up over many years, going back to the 1990s, you can see a bunch of people fixing bikes in an interesting structure that they have created. This is the bike shed. What's going on here is a type of assemblage or social field um, in which you have a bunch of volunteer workers. That's Eddie Merckx. He's not actually a volunteer, but this chap, Stephen, actually was at that workshop. Uh, you have bike parts um, and tools and bike frames and all sorts of uh, objects, but you also have people who have bike problems, they desire to own a bike, they're looking for parts or some assistance to get their bike on the road. So a workshop is a social field, but then that workshop itself is situated within, sorry, a building, which is important, a premises. Um, it also involves knowledge and skills, people impart and socialize and shift that knowledge around. And there's often a workshop organization which has governance and rules and so forth. So the green space of that workshop is situated also within wider networks for bicycle advocacy and campaigning. And also um, social interaction is part of community capacity building and empowerment. And there's a lot of non-market-based transactions that happen within. So a definition of a bike workshop is a not-for-profit community-based organization formed around the restoration and maintenance of bicycles. So it's a form of sustainable transport, a push towards sustainable transport. Or more radically, a space where you can work on your own bike autonomously, but it has symbolic and material aspects, as I think I've shown, as part of the urban commons. Workshops have commitment to low carbon, uh, activity, sustainable mobility, to being open to all, to be an anchor for other activities, to innovate, to reuse human skills, learning and knowledge. And these are often nascent social enterprises that can grow in um, size. Until recently, there have been very, very, very little research in social science. I think two or three of us were really the first people to get interested and to write something about these things.
Um, I've been working on them since 2014, and until big lockdowns, my last trip to examine workshops was last year. My aim of my research was to find out what are community-based workshops, how do they work, what do they contribute. So I've done participant observation in a lot of workshops over around the world. Here are just a few. You'll notice Lancaster, so northern, northern England was definitely a part. I'm currently the chair of WeCycle in Melbourne, which is a refugee and asylum seeker based bicycle project. Uh, the typologies of workshops, this is important, I think. The ones that if you've heard of these at all, you tend to think that you fix your bike yourself and anybody can come along and do that. And there are some examples of sheds where that's the case. Down here, we are actually a type of workshop where staff and volunteers fix up bikes for a limited group of people. In our case, asylum seekers, refugees, those in particular need. So we're a different type of workshop. So this grid or typology, I think is quite useful. Um, next, I'll look at the different uh, aspects of workshops. So where are they? They're quite often found in places with cheap rents or some guaranteed space, often supplied by local councils as in Australia, um, the locations are unpredictable. You don't see them as much in affluent outer city suburbs where there's less cycling anyway. And uh, in some cities they're completely dispersed as in Brussels. This is an older image from a paper I wrote uh, with Inez, um, that's her thesis written at the top there. They're, they're spread around the core of the city and often into some slightly more affluent suburbs on the east side. In uh, Grenoble, you'll see, um, uh, sorry, at Lyon down below, you'll see a lot of workshops spread across the metropolis, some downtown, some in neighboring suburbs, Villeurbanne, and then actually out towards um, uh, the universities to the east. Um, and um, in a typical French countryside there, there's Perigueux, this is north of the Dordogne region, and the Auvergne you'll see uh, a workshop spread all over. So Toul is one I visited and there's one in Perigueux as well. In terms of premises, the space that workshops need is for storage and room for tools and for uh, stands to work on bikes. And often there's a chill out space as well. Financial outlies are gen generally pretty small um, and the premises vary from bare walls and bikes, sometimes no electricity to massive warehouses. A couple of workshops I visited have bought their own buildings. Working Bikes in Chicago is pretty well known in Koreatown. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Bike Kitchen in LA and Working Bikes in Chicago, which is probably the world's biggest workshop. Um, others uh, have pay little or nothing as part of space or they're in squats and so forth, like that one there in Kreuzberg in uh, central Berlin which survived squatter evictions in the 1980s, and there's lots of activities on site. There's the bike kitchen in LA, a space which was purchased using a donation. Here's one of the oldest in a place I used to live in Tucson, Arizona, Bicas. They've moved the location now, but that's been around since 89. Um, and they now have a stable location. And there's the interior, so it resembles a bike shop in some ways, doesn't it? Uh, Worcester Mass, where I went to uni, um, you can see here a slightly more decrepit situation with uh, less good a building, and they've actually um, relocated within the most disadvantaged part of town, Maine South, and um, the original site was built by two members in 2010, uh, and they now work from a different location, primarily. Uh, the bike farm in Portland used the GFC, the global financial crisis, to purchase a very nice building, which they've now filled with bike parts and space to work in Portland. So that's in uh, East Portland. And you can see it's bilingual Spanish English. And there's the biggest one in the world, Working Bikes Chicago. There's just the input of bikes. Here's the chill out room with a piano and a sound system. And they own this entire warehouse building and they ship a lot of bikes actually off to Africa. Uh, as part of a social development effort. Um, the heart of inner city hipsterdom in Berkeley, you can find Biketopia. That's a great little place just in a shop front. 
uh, with all sorts of different activities um, and so on. Right, in terms of aims and missions, there's three different types of workshops, some of which were shown there. Most of them are volunteer community workshops, uh, atelier vélo communitaire in French, because a lot of these workshops are in French speaking parts of the world, working towards vélonomie, and uh, they also might be committed to other forms of social transformation. They're usually in Britain registered as a charity, uh, as well in, uh, uh, Denmark, in um, uh, Brussels, in, in Belgium, 501c nonprofit in the US, etc. And there are a few examples. So uh, this 123 Brussels in Belgium was formed in a squat by the founder who is shown there. They're pretty well organized um, and they survive, as they say, thanks to gifts of unused, broken, crashed bikes and spare parts. Here, anyone can repair or learn to repair their bike. The most keen can build their own bike from scratch. And we also do artistic or experimental projects. Uh, down the road across Brussels is Cicloperativa, one where I spend a fair amount of time. And um, they've moved from that current premises, which they sorted out themselves there. And they uh, service an area with a strong Arab population in central Brussels. Um, some, the second type of workshop has paid labor and shop pricing, their social enterprises. Um, examples will be that bike house in Tucson, Working Bike Chicago. Um, they have a social enterprise model, and so they retain nonprofit status, but they occasionally have some subsidies, like Cyclo, Projet Cyclo, which is in um, uh, Brussels. There it is, that's one of their operations. Uh, you have to pay to use this particular shop. Oh, there's my bike in it. Um, and then C is workshops that have a wider mission for aid and social welfare. Uh, Bath Bikes in the UK is run, it's attached to Julian House, a homeless charity. Um, and you can go along and get your bike fixed for cheap. For cheap. There's secondhand parts and so forth. Um, the Lancaster Bike Project was about refugee and asylum seeker support, really. So we simply built up bikes there. I, I was a volunteer for a couple of years for a certain group of people question is are they really community workshops <clears throat> they sort of are because they serve a, a community often rules are quite well developed in workshops so this is kind of the urban commons but nonetheless there's rules guiding activities the people involved tend to be volunteers and paid staff and there's sometimes conflict between those two groups there's a typical person matt in worcester massachusetts who's an unpaid student at a local community organizer in terms of gender, race and class, there's a, a good deal of men in these workshops. Uh, in our own workshop in Brussels, we have four regular male volunteers, two women. Generally, that's a kind of a norm for the balance. And it was worse in Brussels when I did my more comprehensive study there. Three out of 44 mechanics in the community workshops. There's usually an originator as well as um, the, uh, the team of growing team of staff can be problems when the originator disappears. People like these guys are paid by the workshops. There's enough income from selling bikes to justify uh, paid staff. Um, uh, ADFC in uh, Mitte in Berlin has um, a central photo there says he simply repairs bikes. Um, he, he, he does have some pay, former engineer. Uh, the clientele are usually quite localized, often local residents, um, and um, they, the, the big research questions about the clientele is, are we actually changing tra travel behavior fully? Or are we simply offering new travel options? Um, and how clear is it those links to building, um, you know, more sustainable mobility? The answer is, marginal in some locations, more evidence coming from a variety of masters and PhD studies that there is something big going on. A recent study in Bordeaux is working on that right now. And these are all networked into different bicycle linkage networks, which I, I don't have time to talk about. Um, and two things like critical mass, they're shown in Brussels. That was me taking the photo up near the Palais de Justice. Um, and uh, there are links to the state <coughs> although 
Some workshop participants do not like the state and try to minimize their interactions with government. France is really the center of workshops worldwide. It has masses, that's even an old map. There's now a couple of hundred workshops across the country with a, a big rise and a network work called Le Recyclage. Um, so what I've argued here is that workshops are cheap, usually sustainable and often radical responses to the transport, the sustainable transport agenda. They build demand for cycling um, in material and symbolic ways. They supply bicycles. They also supply a, a proactive travel ethos. They often present um, pictures of sustainable mobility. Um, they sometimes are involved in training and other activities, but they can be precarious in those four areas particularly premises, and they evolve along different pathways. The people involved are of all ages. <laughs> There's plenty of urban activists, social entrepreneurs, bike enthusiasts, and all of their activities has arrived in a carbon constrained world. So I see this as kind of a, a type of urban commons going back to Lefebvre, which is taking back streetscapes. It's occupying sort of marginal spaces in the city, often the inner city, and some of it is formalizing, while other types of workshops don't want to formalize too much. The big division in workshops is this, this is my big thesis to finish with, type A are volunteer status workshops, usually with difficulties about money or premises. <coughs> They're often pretty anti-capitalist and it requires a certain amount of adaptive skill to keep them running, to keep numbers up and to support local populations. Type B are ones with paid staff who still teach the velonomy type of skills, but they reach a different audience. They charge money. They tend to forego too much, many radical actions. So those transition paths are shown here, type A and B. Um, uh, type um, the, um, the workshop that shows the locality, sorry, which is actually A, got those the wrong way around, is going to bump along in terms of its budget, its client numbers and its paid staff. Uh, the B, as it as it goes over time, tends to escalate in terms of budget, client numbers, etc. And these are just ideal Weberian types of workshops. And there are hybrids between those two. Um, so most workshops can offer tools, parts and advice. They're mostly self-governed. They can show participatory mechanical skills, they recycle, they support velonomy, and they're part of the circular economy, to quote the trendy term of the day. And they also can provide, in some cases, local employment, and they certainly are convivial, at least the ones I've worked in. Um, they, they all, but they're also political, they alter power relationships, they take, they're tackling urban, urban congestion in a small way, they're supporting urban justice. And that's increasingly the focus of work by Antonio, Antonio Lugo and others looking at the racial and gendered aspects of workshop culture and cycling culture in general. And it's perhaps a little bit better than it once was at the foundation of all of this. Um, so bike organizations definitely have a place in a community and in the economy. And everywhere you look now, this is Adelaide, in Australia, you find images like this where people are practicing their bicycle skills and learning. So in conclusion, these are an interesting part of urban mobility. They are very present in Northern England in cities like Leeds, York, Lancaster, Manchester, um, Newcastle, they're all over. And I think we should give them more attention. Thank you very much.